Dear guests, I'm Alexandra Danwell, the president of IFA, and I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. First, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which this meeting is taking place, the peoples of the Kulin nation. I also pay my respect to their elders past and present. Our guest today is Professor Wojciech Sadurski. Wojciech Sadurski is Chalice Professor of Jurisprudence at the University of Sydney and Professor of the University of Warsaw Center for Europe. He has previously held a professorship at the European University Institute in Florence for 10 years from 1999 to 2009, where he served as head of the Department of Law from 2003 to 2006. Most recently, Wojtek Sadurski has taught at New York University School of Law, Yale Law School, Fordham Law School and Rutgers University. His areas of research include comparative constitutional law, philosophy of law, and theory of democracy. He is a member of several supervisory and program boards, including the International Association of Constitutional Law, the <clears throat> of constitutional law, the International Society of Public Law, ICONES, and the Institute of Public Affairs in Poland. His most recent books are A Pandemic of Populists, published by Cambridge University Press in 2022, Poland's Constitutional Breakdown, also published by Oxford in 2019, and Constitutionalism and the Enlargement of Europe, published by Oxford University Press in 2012. He also co-edited a book with his colleagues, Adam Charnota and Martin Krieger, both of, of you, Martin and Adam, are present today. The book titled Anti-Constitutional Populism, published by Cambridge University Press in 2022. Wojciech's presentation will take about 40, 45 minutes. This, there will be uh, some questions and discussion following. I now invite Professor Wojciech Sadulski to speak. Wojciech, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you for, for this invitation. And let me acknowledge the importance of the Australian Institute of Polish Affairs. Some of you who are outside Australia may, know, may not know of it. It is a truly extraordinary NGO or think tank or association, whatever you wish to call it, that has been active for many, many years now, trying to build bridges between Australia and Poland, and in particular, invite Polish scholars and politicians to Australia. And I think doing a lot of uh, good work among the uh, Polish Australian community. So uh, it is really a great pleasure to be invited uh, by ourselves, because I also count myself as a, as a member of that uh, wonderful association. Now, let me uh, go over the most traumatic moment of this, uh, of this meeting, that is sharing my PowerPoint. And it always goes wrong, but I hope that this time, since we have rehearsed it, several times it will go well uh did it go okay thank you so look uh, there there is this there is this saying that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover uh, and i certainly don't want you to judge my book but i want you to buy my book and hopefully read it so as you can see the 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 uh, cover is very very beautiful designed specially by giorgio de chirico uh, even if you find after having purchased it that it's not all that exciting, it will definitely look very well on your on your coffee table or wherever you want to put it. Uh, and since the book has been published also in uh, in paperback, and I insisted on on reasonable pricing, it is really not uh, not not a great investment 
in making your living room even more beautiful than it is now. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, two people whom I see now in the list of participants who have helped me with their uh, extremely uh, useful comments on the draft uh, of, of this book. That is Martin Krieger, who also, uh, who also provided me with a title, and Jan Zielonka. Uh, um, there was also Bojan Bugaric, whom I, I'm not sure whether he is following it, but he also provided me with lots of important uh, suggestions. So it goes without saying that all the remaining errors and mistakes in the book are entirely their fault. Let me say uh, now, why, why would you be interested in yet another book on populism? And as this slide shows, there has been a lot of books uh, on populism lately, uh, and in particular, a book published some, I think one year ago, but, uh, a book by Mark Kashnet and Boyan Bugaric, Power to the People. Uh, there were many others. Uh, why yet another? The, the industry of literature, of scholarly literature on, the, um, on populism has been lately very, very lively. So this is, this is what I believe is an added value, which I am attempting to introduce to this existing scholarly and essayistic literature on populism. First of all, I take a particular approach to populism, which is not necessarily dominant, which is not necessarily what may be called the conventional wisdom in, in thinking and writing about populism. That is, I take a decisively what I call institutional rather than discursive approach. Although I do devote an entire chapter uh, in, of my book to populist discourses and populist narratives, and I'll talk about it in this presentation of mine. I do not consider it to be a particularly important definitional sort of defining feature of populism. Maybe because I'm a lawyer, I'm a constitutional lawyer, I'm interested, I'm interested in institutions, and I'm much more interested in what populists do rather than what they say. So I'm interested more in what populists do to institutions and law and constitutions and courts when they come to power rather than what they say uh, before they gain power. That's the first. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that I'm unique in this approach, but it is, I repeat, not a dominant approach to populism, which is very, the dominant approach being very much informed by very influential writings by my friend Jan Werner Müller of Princeton, who basically identifies populism in, in populist narratives, which is fundamentally anti-pluralist. The second point, which I believe is uh, my modest contribution to contemporary scholarship on populism, is that I emphasize populisms in plural rather than populism as such. And I'll say about it a little bit more just in a moment. So let me only foreshadow this point. And the third reason is that today in 2022, in September 20, October already 2022, uh, populism is a more topical issue than ever. And that's for different reasons. First of all, we have watched over the last decade or so steady decline of democracy in the world. According to the most recent report published literally weeks ago by one of the most uh, respectable think tank on democracy, VDEM, at University of Gothenburg, uh, uh, over the last 10 years, we have watched this deterioration in, the, in, the, in, in, in democracy around the world let me just mention that while in 2011, 11 years ago, some 39% of population lived in autocratic regimes, 
Today, the percentage is 70%. And in the, only in the last year, in 2021, while some 15 countries observed improvement in their democratic uh, conditions, 33 countries deteriorated from the point of view of democracy. And the most important thing for my purposes is that some two thirds of this deterioration uh, can be attributed to government, to, to leaders and politicians who came to power democratically, and we call them authoritarian populists. And that leads me to the second point mentioned in this, uh, in this uh, slide, and that is that many populist regimes have undergone a, a stage, a process of consolidation. And in political science, consolidated po populist regime is counted when the populist leader or populist parties win the second consecutive elections. That is, they continue in rule into the second term of office. There's the case of Orban in Hungary, actually it's the third term of office, of Kaczynski in Poland, of Modi in India, etc. And so uh, this consolidation, the fact that, uh, that uh, populist regimes or governments are firmly in power has a number of very important consequences beyond simply the endurance, sort of the temporal factor. Uh, illiberal institutions become entrenched, strengthened. Uh, the memories of good old days of the of democratic institutions slowly fade away. The democratic opposition becomes demoralized. I mean, you know, how long can you can you languish in the opposition benches with no access to all the benefits of the government? And people, ordinary people, learn to live with the regime. And that is, and that is an important factor which is more acute today than ever. We also watch victories of right-wing populists in West, West, Western Europe in particular, in Sweden, more re in Sweden, more recently in, in Italy. There has been uh, an experience of COVID which hasn't been yet properly acknowledged in the literature on populism. And I'll say something about it a little bit later. And finally, war in Ukraine or on Ukraine, Putin's invasion, uh, brutal and unwarranted uh, on Ukraine. One way of conceptualizing this war is along the lines suggested by Joe Biden in his uh, Warsaw speech, that this is just another episode in the worldwide competition between democracy and autocracy. And if that's the case, then we should ask ourselves the question on which side populist regimes are, not in terms of strategic support for Ukraine, but in terms of the characteristics of their, uh, of their institutions. So let me say a few words about what are the features of authoritarian populism as I understand it. And first of all, let me say that in my book, I'm trying to place authoritarian populism in countries such as Poland and Hungary against a broader comparative picture, looking also at the regimes such as that in India, in the Philippines, at least under Duterte, we still don't know what will be the line of Marcos Jr and in Brazil under Bolsonaro, who has only days ago uh, been defeated by Lula, uh, and also Venezuela, although not under the current ruler, Maduro, who is much more uh, open autocrat, but under Chavez, his predecessor. So uh, one, one contribution, especially to Polish discourse on populism, would be to say, well, we are not the only 
unlucky country in the world, which is now in the grips of a populist authoritarian regime. It's let's let's dispense with this thinking that you know all the bad things happen only to us. I mean, we, we are just a case study in a much broader phenomenon. Maybe it's a consolation, I'm not sure, but we should see it in a perspective. So I understand this authoritarian populism, which I discuss in my book, as some sort of in-between or maybe hybrid regime, somewhere halfway between liberal democracy and an open authoritarianism, despotic and oppressive. Uh, it's neither liberal in the sense of having a proper separation of powers, democratic standards and the rule of law, nor is it openly oppressive in the sense of using an all out repression against the, uh, against the enemies. Its characteristics are the following. Uh, and perhaps the most important point is that those populists whom I populist leaders or populist states, which I uh, describe in my, in my book, they can properly claim an electoral democratic pedigree. That is, they issue from uh, free and fair elections. Of course, it is subject to lots of qualifications. And obviously the recent elections in Hungary were not fair. But fairness is a matter of degree. I think that by and large, when you look at countries such as Poland or Bolsonaro's Brazil or Modi's India, the elections were reasonably free and fair. That's, that's the most important thing. And that's something that informs and colors every aspect of discussion about populist authoritarians. They are also based on very high degree of personalization of power. That is, there is always a leader on whom almost everything depends, on whom the whole political power hinges. And without him, who knows? No one even dares, at least those who support populist authoritarians, what will happen if Viktor Orban or Narendra Modi or Jarosław Kaczyński go. There is the sense that they are irreplaceable and they encapsulate the whole political system. Uh, the third aspect of authoritarian populist regimes is that they completely shed or completely reject the principle, any principles of separation of powers, or put it even more broadly, dispersion of powers, whether it's in the traditional European continental sense of tripartite separation of powers, or in the UK and Australian sense of so-called Westminster system, or in the US sense of checks and balances, an idea that power should be dispersed and that power should, that all power should not be monopolized in the single person on this single institution, this is completely rejected. And that's the most important uh, difference to what we would call consolidated good democracies. They are also largely anti-institutional, but I put it in the question uh, with the question mark and I'll only foreshadow it right now because I'll come back to it in a moment. And finally, they almost always are uh, producing and using conspiracy theories uh, to support as a, as a legitimate narrative for their uh, rule. And that is something that I'll talk more about it in a moment. But now let me say something about the origins or the pedigree or the sources of contemporary populisms in plural. And here I would like to paraphrase perhaps the most often quoted beautiful, at least beautiful opening sentence uh, of all literature uh, in the world. No, it's not. It was a, what is it? It was a dark and stormy night. It's another opening sentence. And uh, that is in, of course, in Lev uh, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy 
in its own way. And I paraphrase it into all good democracies are all alike. All good democracies, consolidated, properly working, well-ordered democracies are all alike. But all imperfect, mm, defective, faulty democracies are defective <laughs> and faulty in their own way. The idea being that authoritarian populisms respond to different source of societal demand, usually in the form of fears, anxieties, uncertainties, and provide different responses which are tailored to those different demands. And I suggest <laughs> And those demands, those factors, sorry, I think we have some noise. If I may, if I may ask other participants to please turn your audio off because it may become a little bit disturbing to others. So uh, I believe that, oh, that the, while the number of factors which produce demand for populism is large, it's not unlimited. And in my view, there are the five main factors which we can identify. There are more, but these are the main factors which produce demand and then support for populists. First, a sense of economic insecurity and status anxiety. The sense that you and your group may decline in its affluence, importance, influence in the society, and that you need to do something about it. You compare yourself to others, and you feel that there is this relative deprivation growing. Secondly, xenophobic attitudes towards quote unquote others, dislike, hatred to those who are seen as being different from you, whether in their religion or language or color of skin or ethnicity or sexual orientation. And in particular, the place from which they knock at your door, immigrants. Disenchantment and disappointment with the incumbent political elites, those liberal democratic elites, which are in your capital city, whether it's Washington DC or Budapest, Hungary, which are being seen as completely self-serving, egoistic, uh, cosmopolitan, liberal, not in touch with real people. Four, Resentment against globalization and internationalism. You see your industries and factories closing and industries moving to countries with cheaper labor. And you see very cheap goods which come to your department stores and which erode the demand for locally produced goods. And that produces growing unemployment in your country. And finally, what I would call anti-modernism, you know, the sort of cultural and often religious resentment, dislike for new ways of living, new ways of talking, what is often called with, dis with, 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 with uh, contempt political correctness. Uh, and often secularism, the erosion of value of traditional religion and traditional hierarchies and structures of authority coming with this. Now, if you look at the, take a step back and look at this picture, you, the, 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 the main point of my book is that these different factors never occur with equal intensity in every country where populists come to power, or at least are very popular and have sufficiently high electoral support so that you can have a prognosis that one day they will win. Uh, th these are like, and sorry for this, uh, for this uh, cheap, uh, cheap uh, analogy, a little bit like Lego toys. You know, the number of these boxes, whatever you call them, pieces, Lego pieces, 
is large but not unlimited and you can produce different toys with them and same with populates you know, we, we, we observe different configurations and different in intensity of these different factors in different countries. And whatever is the configuration of those anxieties captured by these five factors will inform a different set of answers by populist politicians who try to convince the society that the very complex issues produced by a mix of these factors may be given a very simple and easy response. Let me say something about populist approach to institutions. And here I'm very much influenced by fantastic writings by Professor Martin Krieger on institutionalism and populism and on the question whether populists are quote unquote institutionalists. And a little bit paraphrasing Martin and adding my own thought to it, I would say yes and no, which is an ugly way of course of answering your own question, but just happened that I said that. Uh, yes, they are institutionalists because they do not begin their rule by abolishing or by, by rejecting the uh, inherited the institutions inherited from the past. So they are not like Lenin, okay? Uh, or they are not like Chavez. Chavez is an exception here because he basically destroyed the traditional parliament and the Supreme Court. But they basically inherit the institutions and they maintain the incumbent institutions. But at the same time, they are anti-institutional in Krieger's understanding because they erode the existing institutions of, the, of their meanings, of, this, of their values, of the sense of purpose, inject their own into them. And in this slide, I show, I just suggest what populists do to the institutions which they inherit in order to, as some of us call it, hollow them out. So they are still there, but they are either just facade, or they serve more often than not something completely different that was the raison d'etre in the first place. So first of all, and you know, these different strategies of hollowing out, again, they uh, emerge differently in different countries. And this is just a partial list. What, they, what populists do to institutions, A, they capture them, which is the simplest thing. They just put their own people into it. They take constitutional tribunal in Poland, and then they put their own people into it, and then it becomes something else. When they can't do it, they duplicate them. They create shadow institutions, institutions which sort of are parallel to the existing constitutional institutions, which sort of outweigh or, 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 or silence or diminish the importance of the institutions they have. That's the case, for example, of National Media Board in Poland. They erode their powers or budget, as was the case of the Constitutional Court in Hungary, when after Orban's uh, constitution of 2021, uh, Constitutional Courts uh, had seen its competence is greatly reduced. The fourth strategy is what I call migration. You take the institution, but you place it in a completely different institutional context. And that different context means that it will become different. The best or perhaps the worst example of that would be Polish prosecutor, public prosecutor structure, where public prosecutors who had enjoyed a degree of independence before, after peace came to power, uh, became integrated into the Ministry of Justice, which completely changed all the chains of dependence and subordination. And finally, you can take the institution so that from the outside, it's still the same institution, but completely restructure it in turn. The case of Supreme Court of Poland. Now, the special anger and aggression of authoritarian populists is 
addressed against courts. And you can understand why. It's not merely because of judicial independence, as we often uh, say, it, but it's also because courts, judges, are perhaps the most significant alternative legitimacy, uh, provide or propose alternative legitimacy in populist states. The whole, as, as I had said, a legitimacy of, of populists, they're somehow declared reasons for exercising power is in the elections. And indeed, they are right. They have won fair and free elections. But courts do not derive their legitimacy from elections. They derive their legitimacy from something completely else. Now, what it is that they derive their legitimacy from is another matter. Usually, it's the sense of impartiality and professionalism and a degree of consent by people to consider judges as some sort of impartial umpire. But they are not there, and they don't exercise their power because they've won election or they, uh, they, they are sort of accountable in an electoral democratic way. And that is something that uh, authoritarian populists cannot stand. So they have to do something about it. What do they do? They take over them, they pack courts, they restructure them. Constitutional Tribunal of Poland has been a great example, even though this uh, 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 extremely saddening of how you can take an institution uh, and by sort of hostile takeover, make it a willful enabler of anything that you want. So the Constitutional Tribunal in Poland, but also Constitutional Court in Hungary, to some extent Supreme Court in, in, in India, started performing an opposite role to its original one. Rather than being a check on the unrestrained majority in the name of constitutional values, it became a very willing and helpful and enthusiastic aid, accessory to the power, to the, uh, to the executive and legislative, which comes to the same because the legislative majority is controlled by the executive in populist authoritarian states in reducing political costs of their decisions. Of course, it has some unexpected consequences to populist rulers. They can no longer say, look, we would like to do X, but the court, our Supreme Court or Constitutional Court wouldn't allow us because everyone knows that Supreme or Constitutional Court becomes just an agency of power. Let me run very quickly because uh, I would like to finish in about 10 minutes. Let me just say a few words about my chapter on constitutions in, in my book. So in some countries, populist leaders were lucky enough to have sufficient constitutional majority, that is a qualified majority in the parliament to replace the old constitution with the new one. That's the case of Chavez in 1999, and that's the case of uh, Orban's Hungary. Uh, but uh, more often than not, they have to work with the old constitution because this still uh, liberal democratic constitution because they don't have sufficient majority to significantly amend, much less replace the old one. And what they do is simply to rule by breaching the constitution, by what my Indian friend, Professor Tarunab, Kaitan calls constitutional shamelessness, behave as if the constitution didn't exist. And in my book, which uh, Alexandra had mentioned uh, before uh, about Polish constitu Poland's constitutional background, I provide a very long list of the ways in which, for example, President Duda, time after time, uh, breached, openly violated Polish constitution. But what is also characteristic of populist authoritarians in their approach to constitutions is what I call literal democracy, which is sort of like a, a, a pun uh, or, or, or a 
or a, or a paraphrase of the word liberal democracy. Their democracy is not liberal, but literal in the sense that they take the constitution as if all that matters for the constitutions were the words of the constitution, the text. And if something is not covered, then it means that anything goes. And again, this literal approach to constitutionalism where no conventions, no unwritten norms and understandings matter is very well observed in the case of Polish constitution, where, for example, all unwritten norms that have been taken for granted as obvious until 2016 have been completely disregarded when the new uh, National Council of Judiciary, Krajowa Rada Sądownictwa in Polish, has been replaced by a completely new entity because there was this sort of gap in the constitution about who elects judicial members of, the, uh, of this uh, body. And this gap really hadn't existed before because there were those unwritten norms and an understanding that obviously they should be elected by judges themselves, to which uh, populists say, but where does it say so? Well, it doesn't say so. Sometimes you have to read the constitution between the lines as American Yale Law School's uh, constitutional scholar Ahir Widamar says. Let me say a few words about populist narratives and what is the most characteristic of authoritarian populism is their, uh, their uh, predilection for conspiracy theories, uh, which may be called paranoia, political paranoia, not in a clinical sense of the word, of course, but in a political sense, as in Hofstadter's famous essay of 1964, that is presenting any problems in the society as a, as a product of some sort of evil forces of a very, very elaborate and shrewd plot by the enemies of the people. So we have this Manichaean vision of the ongoing uh, struggle of the good and evil. The good is of course represented by the populist leader. The evil people, parties, politicians are at the same time extremely weak because society does not support them, but at the same time, extremely strong because uh, people have to be mobilized against them. Uh, so we have all sorts of conspiracy theories which exist in every, I repeat, every uh, uh, populist authoritarian state I study. There is the Smolensk uh, paranoia in Poland. Uh, about the uh, alleged plot to murder uh, President Lech Kaczynski, his wife, and 94 other passengers of Tupolev. There is the Soros lie in Hungary about a plan of George Soros to replace Christian population of Europe, in particular Hungary, with Muslim immigrants. There is so-called love jihad uh, plot uh, in India about Indian Muslims having this scheme of seducing Hindu women in order to increase the Muslim uh, power in, in, in India, etc., etc. And also, what is so characteristic of uh, populist regimes is how much they rely on lies, on deception. And lies are in, pop, in authoritarian populism, not just an attempt to convince people to what is untrue. That would be too simple. It is a very, very, very shrewd way of creating some sort of togetherness. Professor Podgorecki, great Polish sociologist called it dirty togetherness of people united by lie and by knowing that other, that the leaders lie and they know that they lie and they know that the people know that they lie and the people know that they know that they lie. And there is this mutual, if you like, uh, cohesion built by lies 
whereby an, uh, a declaration of believing in the lies is an, a, a symbolic form of accession to populist community. So no one in Poland really believes that Smolensk was an act, was a result of plot. Neither those who say that, nor those who listen to it. But everyone knows that if you want to be in, you have to behave and you have to say as if you believed in it. And let me just quote a sentence which I have just read. I have just finished two days ago reading yet another book by my now favorite uh, American novelist, Colson Whitehead. The book is not his last book, but his sort of second or third la last book called Nickel Boys. And he talks about two uh, characters in his book, and he says this, Turner wasn't angry that Jamie lied to their faces. Turner is a good guy, Jamie is a bad guy in the, uh, in the, in the novel. He, meaning Turner, admired liars who kept on lying even though their lies were obvious, but there was nothing anyone could do about it. Another proof of one's powerlessness before other people. So when people like Kaczynski lie about Smolensk, or people like Orban lie about Soros, they create this sense of powerlessness on the part of, of, uh, of, of the audience because those lies are so obvious, so self-evident, and yet they can get away with all that. So that creates a sense of powerlessness. Those people are so powerful that they not only control the resources, state companies, public media, central institutions, they also have full control over the truth. Now I'll be running very quickly. So let me just say very, uh, uh, very, very briefly my findings about populism, what I call populism in the time of COVID. When COVID came, when the pandemic began, began Many of us, many of all people around the world thought, oh, it's like a God-given gift to authoritarian populists. It's like a war. You know, when there is war or when there is the pandemic, democracy does not count. What counts is mobilization, quick decisions, and full and immediate implementation of those decisions, which is exactly what populist authoritarian would like to have in their state. So, and fortunately, the good news is it has not happened. Populism has not derived any particular gains from uh, the pandemic, because it could have derived those gains if it turned out to be more effective in handling the pandemic. It hasn't. I'm not sure that so at this moment, and it's still like work in, in progress, uh, we can tell that democracies did much better than autocracies in, uh, in facing COVID. Although probably we can, but, but the jury is still out. But at least we can make a weak thesis, and that is that populism has not uh, had any successes, which may be due to its power of mobilization. And maybe that's because of those reasons. Uh, populism as we know it, and here it is exemplified on this slide by, by President Trump, has lots of disadvantages in coping with matters such as pandemic. And from that point of view, perhaps pandemic is not equivalent to a war. Uh, in coping with diseases of that nature, you have to rely on the science, and scientific experts are derided by, by populist authoritarians. Almost all of them think about Trump, think about Bolsonaro. Uh, handling crises like this requires a good deal of transparency because you need to know what is going on. And authoritarians don't like transparency. Think about the first weeks of the crisis in Wuhan in China where uh, no reliable information from the region was allowed. 
It also requires a great deal of decentralization because that's where the action is. The action is in the townships, in the countryside, uh, in hospitals, schools, etc., rather than among central powers. And also it requires a good deal of social and institutional trust, where you trust that the government will not use the information which you, which you need to give uh, for all sorts of uh, invidious, disingenuous purposes, as was the case in Australia when, you know, whatever uh, problems people may have had with the government, no one really thought that by putting your information about where you go and allowing tracing, etc., would somehow empower the government in the ways which could be then used against you. So I'm coming now to my to my conclusions. And my conclusions are about the future. What are the ways out? If populism is a disease, and I believe it is, what is the therapy? What is the cure to this disease? And my suggestion, I start with a very simple and perhaps disappointing answer. The only way out is through the elections. I mean, the, 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 the only recipe one can give to democratic oppositions, in, uh, whether it's in Hungary or India or the Philippines, now in the Philippines is a bit too late, they have to wait for the next electoral cycle is win the election. But of course, it's easier said than done. And winning the election is just a proxy for something much, much broader, for a degree of mobilization of democratic forces, which should lead to the uh, electoral victory. And why non-electoral strategies? I mean, oh, after all, you know, what is this fetish on elections about, you know? Why non-electoral strategies? I don't know, revolution, civil war, are not likely and feasible strategies to combat uh, populism is something that I just take for granted, but I'm happy to discuss in the in the Q and A. So I take it as a certain axiom. But for it to happen, for Democrats to win against authoritarian populists, apart from the issues of mobilization through NGOs, through media, through civil society, through demonstrations, etc., there are some if you like, political technologies which have to be met. There should be high turnout in the elections. There is some evidence from political science that the higher the turnout, the more uh, opportunities for Democrats to win. There should be unity of the opposition. I mean, all this game which is going on now in Poland about whether there should be a single list of the opposition or two lists or three lists, et cetera, is just ridiculous. The, uh, the, the, the outcome of all the empirical political science uh, research shows that the unity of the opposition is the single most important variant factor uh, decisive for combating populists. Think about unity, this very unlikely unity of the opposition against Netanyahu in Israel. And three, there should be a convincing program. And this point seem, may be seen to be in sort of clash with what I've just said about the unity of the opposition, because it would seem that the broader, the more ecumenical this opposition will be, the thinner its program will be, and will be seen as merely negative, that the only thing that unifies at certain point the opposition is its dislike for the populist, which is not a bad program in my language, but to many is insufficient. So here is how I would like to finish to conclude my remarks. I began by saying that there are certain factors which produce demand for populists, such as status anxiety, anti-modernism, xenophobia, etc. And I think that we, and now I take a liberty 
of somehow uh, attributing to the audience and myself a certain community of values, which of course is a great uh, uh, case of chutzpah on my part, but let me do it just for the sake of argument. Okay. And so we need to provide convincing program which does not simply disrespect those anxieties and fears and needs, but provides a better answer than populists do. An answer which does not show disrespect for people who express all these demands, but at the same time is not exclusionary, is not xenophobic, is not discriminatory. But the, an answer which does not neglect some of the very deep needs of individuals, which have been traditionally somewhat disregarded by us, by liberal cosmopolitan uh, Democrats. The values of community, of identity, of patriotism, and of faith in the case of people who have religious faith. And we should not, we should find retreat in democratic liberalism or liberal democracy, if you like, those resources that we believe that these are important matters, that community is important, but community in the sense of equal treatment and equality of all people, that identity is important, but identity also is identity of tolerance, and that patriotism is important as long as it does not degenerate in some sort of nationalism. And I believe that, you know, we should retrieve these values, always remembering that while we should properly disrespect people like Marine Le Pen or Donald Trump or Jarosław Kaczyński or Viktor Orban, we should not disrespect their voters. And that's also the last sentence of my book. Thank you very much. Go to unmute yourself. Yep. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Wojtek, very much for this very, very interesting presentation. It sort of expands what Martin was addressing in his uh, webinar um, not so long ago, but you went into much, de much more depth uh, looking at other issues. Um, therefore, uh, I think uh, the I hope there will be a discussion and questions from the audience, so I don't want to take any more time and just maybe invite the members of the audience to ask questions. So we've got uh, one hand up, please, uh, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, Tom. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Sadusky, for, for a very interesting uh, talk. I'll also put my question in the chat, but basically it struck me that all of the contemporary examples um, that you use are from hard right-wing nativist regimes. So the question then is, is there populist character, um, their anti-elitism, Manichaean worldview and so forth, really the driving force in their democratic decline or should we focus more on this kind of right-wing nativism? Thank you, Tom. I think that what you fairly called right-wing nativism is a characteristic for those populist authoritarian regimes. So I must say that there is a gap or uh, perhaps uh, um, an alleged gap in my thinking. That is, I do not distinguish between left-wing and right-wing right populism, as some people do. I'm rather interested in specific states which meet those criteria which I mentioned at the very beginning. That, that is that the rulers emerge from uh, democratic elections 
But at the same time, they do one, two, three, and four. They do all these nasty things to the institutions. And I don't call them right wing or left wing. Uh, but in, if we apply this right versus left uh, uh, typology or, 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 or taxonomy, we probably would have to call all of them right wing. That doesn't bother me at all. You know. uh, and whether they are nativist, it's very difficult to say because uh, nativism is a loaded concept. Uh, it's, it's something more than nationalism. It elevates ethnic identity to it uh, uh, as the most important criterion for thinking about people. I'm not quite sure that it is uh, so characteristic of all of the populist authoritarian regimes. But a short answer is yes. At a certain point, my analysis converges with what you call uh, dislike for uh, 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 those uh, nativist right wing regimes. Thank you. Thank you. We've got another question from Alexander. Hi, Professor, and thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, I'd like a question just to clarify your view. Um, I bring up Vladimir Putin has been described as a leader that is more of a autocrat and authoritarian rather than a populist leader. Um, in which there certainly are traits that are comparable to the like of the past authoritarians throughout history. Uh, but I'd like to know your opinion. What would make Putin or leaders like him, for example, like Xi Jinping of, of PRC, distinct from these leaders mentioned in your book, like Modi, Bolsonaro, et cetera? Excellent, here it is. So. Uh... I think there are at least two very important criteria which distinguish people like Putin, but also like Xi, and also Erdogan, and perhaps Maduro, uh, who distinguish them, or sir, forget for a moment about Maduro because he just followed Chavez, who is my uh, exemplar, one of my exemplars for authoritarian populists. So let's think about Putin and Erdogan, and maybe Lukashenko, why not Lukashenko? So I, they are not sort of uh, paradigmatic uh, authoritarian populists in my view for two main reasons. The first reason has to do with the quality of the elections which brought them to power. No one would reasonably say that uh, Chairman Xi reached his position in free and fair elections, because that would be a joke nor anyone would say that about your namesake, Alexander Lukashenko, or about, uh, or about Vladimir Putin. You know, so they cannot say, look, we have the legitimate support of the majority. Of course, they can say that, but we know that they lie. But, put, but, but, but Orban and Kaczynski and Modi can say that. That's the first point. And the second point, which I hadn't mentioned in my uh, presentation because I didn't have time for it, is about trajectory. So all those, yeah, all those populist regimes that I'm interested in are a result of democratic backsliding. That is, they are a picture of deterioration compared to the status quo ante. Before Kaczynski, there was a liberal democratic regime in Poland, very imperfect with all sorts of problems, but it was democratic. And so was the case of Philippines before uh, Duterte. And so was the case of India before Modi and so on. So there was already a higher level of achievement of democratic status, which then dramatically deteriorated. In my book, I produce an annex in which I analyze very, very briefly the sort of rankings of Freedom House, VDEM, and The Economist. And I show 
how on all the democratic criteria there has been there have been this negative trajectory. But we can't say that about about Putin's Russia. I mean, we can't say that Putin somehow followed a democratic government of of Yeltsin or. Uh, and same about uh, about uh, about Lukashenko. And maybe just let me add one one third point, uh, Alexander, and that is that for me, what is very important about, and I again I I, I put it to one side because of lack of time, about those populist authoritarian regimes is that they use very sparingly repression. I mean, they try as much as they can not to use indiscriminate, brutal oppression against people. You don't have prisons uh, crowded with political prisoners. You don't have police treating people extremely brutally. You, can, you don't have extrajudicial killings, etc. These are regimes that I hate to be positive about them, but I have to say that these are regimes which are relatively economical on the use of violence. But that's not the case of Russia, Belarus, or Turkey. So, and, and of course, this fact that they don't use much violence unless they feel it is absolutely necessary for their survival, uh, produces all sorts of consequences, which I discuss in my book. And one of them is that to the, an outside observer, they may seem to be perfectly fine, you know, I mean, what I mean, there's no terror, you know. What sort of what sort of oppression are you talking about? There is no oppression, you know, but there are other other mechanisms which render their system less than democratic. Thank you. We've got another question from Mike. Yeah, hello. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss the what I think is a very interesting case of Fidel Castro uh, in Cuba, where I think he started uh, his initial ideology was populist in nature, but then after a few years radically converted into uh, something else. I was wondering if you could discuss the Cuban example. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh... I cannot, I'm afraid. I'm uh, relatively uncontaminated by knowledge of, uh, of Cuba beyond what everyone reads in the newspapers. I haven't studied it. Uh, what I can say is that to me, Fidel Castro is probably one of those, one of the exemplars of a relatively well described and well known, uh, well known a pattern whereby a leader in a colonial or post-colonial country comes to power uh, not through the elections but through more or less popular support in his fight, fight against oligarchy which is strongly supported by an imperial colonialist power uh, and enjoys at the beginning strong support and then very quickly the because precisely because he or she usually he has no uh electoral legitimacy doesn't care about any institutions and democracy and moves into indiscriminate terror this is the case of many post-colonial states in africa in latin america of which fidel castro would be one of of those cases, but this is not at all similar to my picture and my model of populist authoritarians or authoritarian populism. Thank you. Thank you, Wojtek. Uh, another question from Charlie Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, thanks for the fascinating talk, uh, Professor. Um, well, just sort of on the inverse of um, Alexander's point around the characterization of regimes. Do you have a defining point at which the liberal dem democracies become the popular state? So, for example, where you have, you know, what a Gambit would call a state of exception, um, Guantanamo Bay um, in America, the offshore detention regime in Australia, 
where is, is, is the answer in the institutional integrity of courts and, and the media and things like that? Um, and at what point can we see these democratic countries, you know, sort of go towards the, the populist trend you identify? Yeah, so look, I think that no one can go get better on this issue than Levitsky and Ziblatt in their book, uh, How Democracies Die. And they use this beautiful sort of sport analogy. They say, look, and they are actually not using my language of authoritarian populism. They talk about sort of the generation of, of democracy. But they say, look, when some of, and that's also the case of Professor Adam Przeworski and many others. When, auto, what, what, what should we watch? What are the warning signals that we should, you know, sort of red light uh, when we see uh, something is going wrong? And they say uh, those autocrats do when they come in uh, electoral. Uh, fairness to power, they do three things, or at, least a, or at least one of the three things, but usually three things taken together. A, just like, you know, suppose you are a coach of a, a team, rugby team, and you want to play dirty game. What do you do? You rewrite the rules of game, you capture the umpires, and you sideline your opponent. And they use this analogy to the political game. You rewrite rules of the game and change the constitution in a way which skews the, the uh, playing field to your favor. B, you capture the umpire. Umpires in democracies are judges. So you put your own judges. And finally, you sideline your opponents. You demonize the opposition. You don't give them the right to say what they want in the parliament. You know, you reduce maybe the question time or things like that. You know, when you notice any of these things, and in particular, when you notice the accumulation of these things, ah, something is bad, which is going on. Each democracy is doing lots of nasty things, which do not necessarily degenerate into institutional uh, autocratization. Australian policy of offshore, uh, what is it, refugee, of placing refugees in offshore places is horrific. But it's not part of this institutional degeneration of the system. It's just a very bad policy, inhuman. So it's not that we should now start thinking, ah, isn't Australia becoming uh, an author authoritarian populist state? But I think that many Americans under President Reagan could have thought precisely that because these are the things which he tried to do. Fortunately for American Democrats and for American democracy, he was too much straight jacketed by the institutions, by the institutions of judicial review, federalism and checks and balances. And he, you know, he could shout a lot, but he couldn't do a lot. And I'm more interested in those unfortunate cases when perhaps populist leaders shout a little, scream a little bit less, but do a little bit more than Trump did. And these are truly worrying uh, cases, which I study in my book. Thank you so much, uh, Wojtek, for this response. And we've got a question in the chat from Claudio Bozzi. Uh, that's regarding the electoral turnout. How can abstention and declining electoral participation be reversed? Is the flight from the public sphere only anti-establishment disappointment or equally a search for alternative form of participation outside of politics? Well, I think both. I think this is a very good observation and a very good question. And indeed, there are many people in uh, countries which are ruled by various sorts of autocracies which believe that somehow electoral democracy has exhausted its potential and now we must think about some other things. So about democracy based on citizens juries or democracy based on supranationalism. You know, we should take much more seriously our, say in the case of Poland and Hungary membership in the European Union and think about the ways in which our part in this uh, membership in this democratic architecture of Europe 
informs our own choices. But maybe I, my, my, my powers of imagination are too limited. And I don't think that any of these alternative routes are substitute for good old fashioned electoral democracy. And that is that we should win the election. We, whoever the we are, uh, and we should win against the populist. So, sorry, what was the second point of, uh, because I haven't, I haven't read the, so uh, the first one. Uh, uh, yeah, how to stop and about, about the absten abstention. I still believe that abstaining in democracy is a sin, is a civic sin. Of course, everyone has a right. To it. I, I don't support the Australian system of compulsory vote. I believe that in a liberal democracy, as I, as I understand it, everyone should have a right not to participate in politics. But I can, uh, I can uh, criticize such people. So I think that people should vote. And I believe there is a relatively thin empirical evidence for it, which I provide in my book, that the, any extra number of voters beyond those which were in the previous elections could more advantage the Democrats than the populists. The, again, empirical basis for it is relatively weak, but I think there is some speculation which can support it. For example, we may say that populists such as peace have a very disciplined constituency. So they have more or less exhausted the constituency of their voters in the last elections and the next, next election will not add much more to it. But liberal Democrats are relatively lazy you know, and they go and they have barbecue on the election date, etc. So I think that more of these extra voters who come to vote, if the turnout is higher, will support uh, Democrats. How should we, how should we uh, make sure that they are not absent? Well, we should be alarmists. We should alarm them. We should say seriously, this is not a trivial matter. We are in a very, very bad shape in countries such as Poland and Hungary. You know? And if they win again in Poland in 2023, who knows, maybe this will be the last free election that we will see. And I'm not being here disingenuous and sort of like uh, with my melodramatic Jeremiah, as someone may call it, I, I really believe that. Thank you so much, Wojtek. Uh, are there any other questions, please? I cannot see any new questions coming from there. I can the see Alexandra raising her hand. Yes, uh, is it Dorota? No, Alexandra Danwell. Okay, go ahead. Just unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember your slide where you said that the community, um, that the, what was it, the community, the, um, Patriotism and uh, what was the identity. third element? Sorry, identity. Identity mattered in building the unity of the populists. Um, I would like to hear how you can imagine that the opposition to the populist um, politics might actually use the same concepts to unite themselves. And one of the roles I see for IPA is, is actually create the community that will unite us to present the views and educate the public about the dangers, but also about the positive aspects of true democracy. Well, all these three values, community identity and patriotism, are very dear to us liberal democrats, except that we've been, we have been somewhat lax in emphasizing it. I mean, what, exactly. does commu what does community mean? Community means that we do certain things 
together. We do not close ourselves in our separate uh, in our separate uh, rooms or, or or spaces, but we go out and do certain to get certain things together. When people protested, when liberal Democrats protested against capital courts in 2017, there was a great sense of community. I felt this community outside the Supreme Court building in Warsaw, where I and Martin Krieger were lucky enough to to be part of the of the crowd. That was community. That was liberal democratic community. But we weren't sort of like atomistic individuals. We were there together. And people, those liberal Democrats in Poland, my friends in the open Democrat, uh, oh, oh, sorry, forgot the name of the NGO who help Ukrainian uh, refugees in Poland have a great sense of community. They liaise together. They find where our uh, flats to uh, to make available to our uh, Ukrainian guests, etc. Then there is the issue of identity. We think identity, something that identifies, characterizes us as a people. And of course, there are things of which we should be proud. And one of those things of which we should be proud is our tolerance to people who are slightly different or very much different, you know, but that is our identity. It's not the identity which only attrib our attribute, but it is our attribute and we should emphasize it. And finally, patriotism. I'm a patriot, you know, I love Poland, you know, and, and Poland is very important to me. I can live wherever I want because I'm lucky enough and privileged enough but no one will tell me that I'm not patriotic. So, you know, we should be open about it and not ashamed of mentioning those values, which often are being somehow, you know, appropriated by right-wing nativists as, uh, as uh, Tom in the first contribution to this debate called it. Or narrowly, or narrowly understood as very nationalistic rather than European, for example, identity. Any, any more questions, please? Maybe last okay. question. I did have a question. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Professor Sadrowski for a very informative talk. I've enjoyed it very much. And um, being based in Poland and living uh, this populism day by day, you know, um, I recognize it all happening in practice. And my question in particular refers to the election process, which we observe in Poland uh, as being, um, along with all the other institutions, the institution of elections is deteriorate, has deteriorated very much during the last six, seven years of the populist rule. Um, and how do we ensure, as a, what we call ourselves a democratic opposition or de democratic uh, voter, how do we ensure that we can win the election in an fair way when the government, uh, now the party, ruling party, uh, not only all their politics is partisan, um, you know, uh, basically just um, de devised to be feeding the ruling party and its voters, um, and we observe it to a very, very, you know, to a growing degree. It, 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 it happens in, in, it is happening increasingly. Um, and uh, we know that the election is planned for, you know, 23 or 24, but no, the different, campaign different. has already started, no, you know. No. The ruling party is doing everything now possible to Mm, uh, in, on many levels, and you know, I could go on and on, but um, to um, to actually make sure that they have a base in which they can, you know, they can somehow um, not win, but you know, they can call themselves as winners of the elections. So this is a quandary to me. How do we how do we prepare for it? Yes, it is a very big quandary, but the starting point is rather pessimistic. That is that we have no other way. 
you know, we are a little bit like a boxer with one hand tied up behind him, but still that's the only way he can win. You know, there is no other way. Yeah. So I do not think there is another way of restoring democracy in Poland than by winning the election. And if there is any consolation is that it's much, much worse in, uh, in Hungary. So there is Freedom House, uh, Freedom House uh, indexing or sort of ranking of different countries from the point of view of fairness of the, their electoral system on the scale of one to four, where one is the best, four is the worst. Uh, Poland is still in the category one, very high. Hungary is in the category three, where basically uh, elections are unfair. And that's correct, you know, I mean, election, electoral system in Hungary is completely and totally skewed against the opposition by various devices, including so-called population replacement, gerrymandering, uh, changing of the terms of the parliament, all sorts of things which I briefly describe in my book. But going back to Poland, well, of course, the, the next elections will not be fair in the sense of fairness in a democracy. And the, probably the most obvious unfairness is that public media became a propaganda arm of the ruling party. And these are public media, that is, they are being supported by the taxpayers. So we, and I'm also a Polish taxpayer, we pay for the media which actively um, instigate hatred towards us and support political party. But that's, but that's the situation we have, and we have to work with that. So I think that there's no, if you like, template, no set of easy remedies which I could offer. One thing is there has to be a very huge mobilization from now on the, in, of, the, of the civil society. That is, as I said, elections are not about the elections and about the, elect, the election date. They are about the mobilization in the months leading up to the elections. Secondly, there should be very strong pressure on the unity of the opposition. One list, no more nonsense about two lists, three lists, and all these you know, games. Uh, we just simply disregard clear and unambiguous uh, empirical studies on the unity of the opposition in the, on the election day is the strongest, the highest predictor of opposition's victory, especially in the electoral system as we have in Poland under so-called don't uh, system of counting votes and translating them into seats in the parliament. Three, we have, fortunately in Poland, we have lots of assets. We have truly independent private media. They are not as, privileged by the government, but that's too bad. But it's much more than is the case in Hungary, you know, and we should yeah. exploit it. And finally, this another strong asset is that we are part of the European Union. And we should have all the support from the EU we can have. We should have foreign observers from EU, from OECD. And we, liberal Democrats, should make sure that in all electoral committees where ballots are being counted, there are representatives of the of the opposition who will look and, and make sure that the ballots are properly counted because now electoral commissions are also captured by the government. So this, these are simple things, but in reality, they are extremely costly and difficult to organize. You should start preparing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank Martin. Sorry, I would like to take voice. Thank for Sadunski. I would, I would, I would thank Martin anytime, anytime. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank for everything for the well, fact that he is uh, there. Um, are there any more questions? If not, I think we reached the time limit.
I think no, there are many no more questions. questions coming. Yes, no more questions and many thank yous coming um, as messages. So I would like to thank you again officially, Professor Sadowski. I think that was a very successful and very interesting meeting. Uh, I I would like to, you know, underscore that IPA is a friendly organization where we share our views and our experiences. And uh, I would like to invite, you know some of you maybe to join our organization to support us in that way. Thank you.